sigma psi lecture for especially pleasing me see so many students uh, coming. If you're not familiar with sigma psi, we, uh, we bring in distinguished lecturers from around the country and, and present programs uh, uh, that we think would be of interest to, uh, to a broad audience on, on campus. It's always uh, a unique pleasure to uh, count among those internationally known people some of our own superstars. And so we have a chance tonight to, to hear from one of our own. Uh, Dr. Don Bites is, is a Charles F. Curtis Distinguished Professor of Agriculture in the Department of uh, Animal Science. And then he has a uh, Professor of Animal Science and Professor of Biochemistry. He has a uh, Bachelor's and Master's degrees from University of Illinois and PhD from Michigan State University. His research uh, basically relates to biochemistry and physiology of nutrition. And uh, in this capacity, he works with uh, animal nutritionists as well. It's, it focuses on both human and, and animal nutrition. And uh, his website lists several uh, very interesting projects. And uh, talking with him briefly this evening, he has a project monkeys that is not listed on his website, so he has a lot of things uh, of interest going in. Tonight, he's going to talk to us about, about conjugated uh, linoleic acid, a component of animal fats with human health fats. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored to see so many of you here tonight, and I hope uh, what I say is, uh, is of interest to you and, uh, and useful. Uh, what I plan to do is uh, tell you a little bit about uh, conjugated linoleic acid, a compound of animal fats with human health benefits. Now, I, I can generalize and say that uh, this molecule has uh, really stimulated a whole wave of new research uh, with nutritionists around the country. It's uh, 10 years ago that was bovine somatotropin, or BST, while today it's CLA. Uh, it's really stimulated uh, much interest, but there's less controversy with it, so far at least. So uh, here's the outline of what I uh, plan to tell you about tonight, is to uh, discuss a bit that CLA is a nutraceutical. And what is CLA? I'll comment a bit about what is CLA and what foods contain CLA. And then some data on health benefits. I'm not going to go into a great amount of data, but some. And then I'd like to uh, make you aware of the uh, different amounts of uh, research, in fact, a fairly extensive amount of research that's being conducted at Iowa State on CLA. And then uh, comment a bit about the atherosclerotic index of different fats, and that's a way of measuring whether, in fact, CLA improves the healthfulness of foods. And then a few comments about future research. Um, okay, first I'd like to uh, make a comment about functional foods. This is a, a new term that human nutritionists are throwing around these days. Uh, functional foods is an important topic because of, uh, of its definition. Definition of a functional food is a food, either natural or formulated that will enhance physiological performance or prevent or treat diseases and disorders. Or the uh, Institute of Medicine's uh, Food and Nutrition Board has a definition for functional food. It's any food or food ingredient that may provide a health benefit <coughs> beyond the traditional nutrients that that food contains. So uh, uh, garlic for example, is considered a functional food because of some of the allylic molecules that are contained in garlic that are thought to have some health benefits. Well, what about a nutraceutical? This is, uh, I've served on a committee in the uh, NRC and uh, I can tell you the FDA would love to have a good definition that would stand the test of the legal system. Uh, what is nutraceutical? As uh, taken from the Handbook of Nutraceuticals and Functional Foods, a nutraceutical is chemicals found as a natural component of foods or other ingestible forms that have been determined to be beneficial to the human body in preventing or treating one or more diseases or improving physiological performance. Uh, that's uh, 
a working definition of a nutraceutical. By the way, how do you think nutraceutical should be spelled? You know, nutrition is N-U-T-R-I-T-I-O-N. And uh, somebody at the cast office called me the other day and says, how should you spell nutraceutical? And everywhere I've seen it, it's always spelled N-U-T-R-A. But I really think that that's a misnomer. It should be an I. That's just a thought. <clears throat> so, nutraceuticals. What are some of them? Uh, here's a way of classifying a group of compounds that fit the term nutraceutical. Isoprenoids, uh, carotenoids, saponins, like in soybeans, tocotrienols and tocopherols, those are vitamin E. Uh, molecules and simple terpenes, so isoprenoids is one class. Phenolic compounds and a group of molecules there, the isoflavones, uh, several people at Iowa State conducting research on isoflavones in soybeans, for example. Uh, protein amino acid based materials. Uh, folic acid, I believe, is going to uh, have a greater interest in the future because of its role in uh, homocysteine control. And homocysteine is going to be a new risk factor in heart disease. Just watch. Uh, carbohydrates and derivatives. Uh, Non-sterol lipids, and here's where CLA stands. And so that's why I'm telling you a little bit about nutraceuticals, because CLA is one of the many kinds of compounds that are called nutraceuticals. Uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, the omega-3 type, monounsaturated fatty acids, single lipids, and lecithin. Uh, sterols, and it's interesting that the handbook doesn't contain uh, sterols as uh, nutraceuticals, but I added them because they are. Uh, many of you have probably heard of Benicol. Uh, Benicol, a new type of margarine that contains stanol esters that have been extracted from uh, tree bark. That uh, if you consume a certain one and a half grams of that a day, I believe it is, one and a half grams a day, you'll have significant lowering of your blood cholesterol. Uh, minerals, uh, microbial uh, uh, compounds, uh, probiotics and prebiotics are considered nutraceuticals. Well, uh, so CLA is one of the uh, nutraceuticals that's uh, actually found in, uh, in animals. Animal nutraceuticals, so foods derived from animals, and I'll comment more specifically in just a moment, contain CLA. Icosapentanoic acid and docosahexanoic acid, DHA, EPA, those uh, are long chain omega-3 fatty acids in fish. And those are also uh, considered nutraceuticals because they improve physical performance and health when in greater amounts in food. Uh, so here's a group of microbial nutraceuticals as well. Uh, some, many of these are uh, parts of yogurt or uh, sweet acidophilus milk. You've heard of that, lactobacillus acidophilus. Uh, and uh, the bifidobacteria, many of these bifidobacteria are uh, commonly put in uh, yogurts. And they're actually uh, fecal organisms, but they're uh, put in yogurt. We like them very much. Okay. Um, well, who discovered CLA? Uh, and so you can vote for the discoverer. Uh, Michael W. Parisa. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure you get the Chad removed. Uh, Pat Buchanan, Al Trinkle, and F.C. Parrish. These are uh, two Iowa State scientists. Well, it turns out it's uh, Michael Parisa uh, at the University of Wisconsin. He's got numerous patents on uh, various aspects of uh, conjugated linoleic acid. And uh, actually, he uh, it was serendipitous that he discovered uh, the uh, CLA because he was looking for a mutagenic agent in charcoal grow Hamburg. This was uh, back in the 80s and uh, there was pretty good evidence that there's something in hamburger that's a mutagen based on the uh, Bruce Ames test and he found a lipid soluble anti-mutagen instead because uh, uh, topical application of the extract decreased mouse epidermal carcinogenesis rather than increasing carcinogenesis found a decrease and so he took uh, several years and lots of uh, hard labor and uh, many graduate students working many hours and they identified that anti-mutagen as CLA and that opened the floodgates of research on CLA because my goodness here's something in an animal product that's anti-carcinogenic in hamburger in broiled charcoal broiled hamburger 
and uh, don't recount that ballot. So what is CLA? Here's the CLA uh, structure. Uh, Compare it to uh, common linoleic acid. Uh, for reference, soybean oil is about 60% linoleic acid, of course, attached to uh, in triglyceride form. And here is uh, linoleic acid, 9 cis, 12 cis, for those of you who have sufficient organic chemistry training. And uh, the, here, the yellow is the double bonds, and there's two single bonds in between the double bonds. And that's the normal way of fatty acid double bonds in, uh, <coughs> in naturally occurring fatty acids, except for the conjugated linoleic acid. You see that's 9 cis, 11 trans. Conjugated only one, one single bond in between the two double bonds. And these are the two most commonly occurring uh, conjugated linoleic acid isomers. The 9 trans and 11 cis. Oh, excuse me. Uh, one of them should be 10 12. And this is the 10 12. So that should be 10 12. But anyway, two isomers that uh, occur, and one of the double bonds is cis, and one is trans. Well, um, here's where, what you can eat to get some uh, CLA in your diet, this uh, magic uh, anti-cancer molecule I'll talk about again in a moment. The most prevalent naturally occurring isomer is the, the 9-cis trans-11 isomer. You see uh, in all these foods, 80 to 90 percent of the isomer, that's the form of the isomer, and, and the other remaining isomer is probably the 10-12. But uh, look at meats, and you see uh, meats from ruminants have in the order usually the fat, uh, fat, the CLA content expressed as milligrams per gram, and just keep these figures in your mind, anywhere between four and six. So we're gonna reflect on that as we look at some experiments in a moment. Four to six. So fresh ground beef, four. Pork you see, uh, very little. And uh, I'll show you that the CLA is formed in the rumen of ruminants. Chicken, but less, much less ground turkey. It's interesting, turkey have intermediate between uh, ruminants and non-ruminants. Seafood, uh, little, but uh, cheese, because it's from uh, milk fat, you see four to six figures. Uh, all other dairy products, the CLA content, four to six, and vegetables, uh, trace amounts. Uh, well, where would you get some CLA uh, today? Well, you could go to the North Grand store and buy it. And uh, until about a month ago, it would have been produced by Con <coughs> sold by Conlinko out of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. And they get it from a company that makes it in, uh, in, Nor in Norway, I believe it is, from sunflower oil undergo that undergoes hydrolysis and partial reduction to produce the CLA-rich oil. That's about 60% uh, CLA. And here's some of that uh, in this bottle. It just looks like soybean oil. And this is not as a triglyceride, but as a free fatty acid. So it's been hydrolyzed from the triglyceride form to uh, present as a free fatty acid. Now that's how you can make it from naturally occurring fats, like uh, sunflower oil. Uh, and this is how animals make it. Animals biohydrogenate linoleic acid in the rumen. So when animals eat linoleic acid, as when they eat uh, corn, there's linoleic acid in the corn oil, uh, sterified linoleic acid undergoes hydrolysis, producing linoleic acid that may be absorbed, but most of it's not. But it goes, undergoes an isomerase activity uh, contributed by a few types of bacteria in the rumen that live there and produces CLA that may be absorbed. But in fact, most of the CLA is reduced further instead of, um, so here you see the double bond is just moved from the 12th to the 11th position, becomes a trance. Uh, most of the CLA is reduced further to mycenic acid, which is in fact 18-1 trans 11. And that may be absorbed as well, but most of it is not. And most of that gets reduced further to stearic acid, and then that gets absorbed fairly efficiently. So most of the linoleic acid that, that uh, ruminants consume is converted to stearic acid. And that's why ruminant fats are more saturated. This is converting a polyunsaturated fatty acid to a saturated fatty acid. 
But some of these intermediates along the way are absorbed, and one of them is, is CLA. Um, so um, that great molecule is of great interest to uh, human nutritionists, animal nutritionists, animal scientists. I made this slide listing as animal scientists. Uh, human nutritionists would say the same thing. Uh, inhibit carcinogenesis, and I'll show a couple numbers on that. This is why CLA is of great interest, because of that inhibition of carcinogenesis that's been documented over and over again uh, after Parisa made his initial discovery at Wisconsin. Uh, inhibits atherosclerosis, and I'll comment a bit about that. It increases immune system, and uh, a graduate student in animal science uh, has some really nice work in showing how CLA improves the immune system of pigs, and presumably it would do the same to people. Uh, improves feed efficiency in pigs, that's good news. Uh, decreases body fat, that's good news. For humans, it's good news for animal scientists. Increases lean, that's good news. Increases bone ash, decreases bone loss, increases trabecular bone formation. So it probably has a role in, in bone formation, and I, don't, I won't show any data on that, but Bruce Watkins at University, or at Purdue University, is uh, studying this whole process of how CLA improves bone health. And uh, greater glucose tolerance. So, gosh, so many good things. You see why CLA has become so popular? And I cannot make a list of negatives. Uh, but I'll bring out a couple in just a moment. Okay, here's uh, just uh, some numbers. One experiment I'm going to show, of, uh, or two. <coughs> I'm going to show two uh, sets of experiments for uh, anti-cancer. And so here's an experiment with, uh, let's see, I, th I think this was rats or mice, uh, measuring tumor incidence in the mammary gland. And so the mice, or rats, I think they were fed CLA, none, up to 0.5% of the diet. And the incidence of tumors, 56, decreased down to 36. And the total number of tumors was cut in half. And so Clement Imp reported these data, and he's reported many papers showing pretty much the same thing, that CLA decreases the incidence of tumors. Well, that's when you add purified CLA like this to the diet of those experimental animals. Well, what about if you uh, feed a natural food? You know, the whole intent of nutritionists is to teach people to consume food rather than supplements, okay? So here, anti-cancer effect of CLA in butter. Uh, scientists at Cornell uh, produced uh, butter from some cows that uh, made, the butter had 0.8%, uh, 0.8 grams per 100 grams, and that's, uh, that's uh, about 80 times, eight times, eight times what normally is present in uh, butter. And then uh, compared that with some uh, commercial CLA preparations. Two companies, Matre and Nucheck. And you see the control animals, 28 out of 30 incidents of cancer with 92 tumors. Uh, the incidence was almost in half when they're fed the butter. And the number of tumors is in half. And it's equivalent for the uh, commercial CLA. So here's another study uh, that shows that CLA decreased cancer incidence. And, uh, and every study that I've read, you, show, you can see a decrease in the incidence of cancer. Well, what about body fat? The best studies so far on body fat showing the greatest effect are in mice. And these, this work was reported out at the University of Wisconsin by Park, and he fed CLA to some mice and found major decreases in fat percent in the carcass of these mice. Uh, and increase in body protein. And they, they were trying to figure out why, and uh, one of the observations was that this particular enzyme, which is very important for the oxidation of fatty acids, is increased. And so perhaps these mice were using fatty acids more as a fuel and uh, storing less of it. Also, uh, CLA decreased lipoprotein lipase in adipocytes and increased lipolysis. The main point of this is that CLA decreased the mechanisms by which the mice have to store fat. 
so they have less cap capability of storing fat, and so they didn't get as fat. And so that led uh, scientists at Wisconsin, and in fact Dr. Atkinson in particular, to uh, get a, to write a proposal to the NIH, and uh, this study has been uh, essentially completed, the first study of uh, st determining the CLA effect on human obesity. And so they had obese people participating in the study, and the best I can say is it got mixed results. It wasn't clear cut as in mice. Uh, and every time, and that's fairly typical though, uh, people are very heterogeneous compared to uh, a lot of these inbred mice that you can get for uh, experiments. But one thing that was shown is that CLA-fed humans lost the most weight. Uh, and so the, the results were uh, mixed, but yet gave optimism to the researchers. They've uh, rewritten their proposal and got it funded for a follow-up study, and an Iowa State graduate, Leah Wiggum, is, uh, is actually uh, helping uh, in the repeat study to see if, in fact, CLA can be an anti-obesity food. Wouldn't that be interesting? A fat that decreases body fat. Uh, try that one on. Okay, well, what about uh, heart disease? One of the biggest risk factors in heart disease is blood cholesterol. And so the higher your cholesterol, the greater risk, or the lower cholesterol, the lesser risk. Well, uh, David Kraszewski is Mr. Cholesterol at the Wistar Institute, and David Kraszewski fed rabbits CLA for 20 week, 24 weeks and followed their blood cholesterol concentration. And lo and behold, he found that the control animals had blood cholesterol of this concentration during that growth period, and, the, uh, and they were feeding cholesterol along with this. And when they used CLA in these rabbits, they had a decrease in blood cholesterol. Uh, Bob Nicolosi at uh, another institution has shown the same kind of data. Uh, LDL cholesterol goes down as well. HDL cholesterol stays constant. So everything looks good with rabbits. But are rabbits humans? No. And will humans behave like rabbits? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, nobody has really done a good study yet and on uh, CLA feeding on, on uh, human blood cholesterol. Well, this is uh, two studies that are, are pretty uh, challenging. Uh, two very large epidemiological studies. Uh, the largest one is, is number one, and I, I'm not going to go present all the data, just show you the highlight. Uh, some people in uh, Finland conducted an epidemiological study of people consuming variable amounts of milk. And uh, Finnish people, I guess, at least when this study was done, consumed largely uh, whole milk, where uh, in this country we're consuming more and more skim milk. So what the uh, study involved was a women consuming <coughs> variable amounts of milk fat. Now, of course, in mixed diets throughout uh, Finland, uh, diet composition varied extensively, but milk consumption was plotted as a function of in incidence of breast cancer. <coughs> and the, the conclusion was very, very clear that higher intakes of milk and milk fat associated with lower risk of breast cancer. So why was that? Well, nobody knows for sure, but you could say, well, it's the CLA in the milk. And that's what the authors wanted to say. But uh, it's, uh, it's hard to come to definitive conclusions with large uh, studies like this where it's so multifactorial. Uh, some individuals in uh, UCLA <coughs> did a similar type of study, epidemiological study, and they were looking at coronary heart disease and show that coronary heart disease decreases with higher intakes of whole milk and, and uh, CLA. Uh, and that's, uh, that is uh, challenging for uh, many of us to think about because normally you're taught to think that higher intakes, higher intakes of saturated fat will raise blood cholesterol. But in, ep in this uh, epidemiological study, higher milk intake was associated with lower coronary heart disease. What else varied? As people drank more milk, what did they eat less of? So you have to think that way. Um, 
By the way, if you want to stop and ask me a question, any time, stop me any time and ask a question, that's fine. I don't mind. I like discussions. Well, uh, how much CLA should you consume? Well, if you extrapolate from rats a Clement Ip study on uh, cancer development, you would calculate that you should consume at least one gram and possibly up to three grams per day of CLA. Now, I think at the price at North Grand Store, there'd be about $30 worth of CLA pills per month. So about a dollar a day. And it seems like that's what uh, people that put out supplements, they figure, well, people are willing to spend a dollar a day for better health, or allegedly better health. So you get about three grams a day, and how should you get it? Well, you could do it by buying it as pure uh, oil, just like I showed in the bottle. Or we could uh, develop foods that are richer in CLA than they now are. And we could perhaps feed uh, CLA to food animals and produce meat, milk, and eggs that's richer in CLA. Or why don't we genetically modify plants? Make a new GMO for the public to talk about. And uh, this one could contain that enzyme called <coughs> isomerase that converts linoleic acid to uh, conjugated linoleic acid. All you have to do is move a double bond in one position. That seems simple. And there's an enzyme in bacteria that can do it. And if you put that bacteria into uh, soybeans, couldn't you uh, make soybean oil have 60% CLA in it, just like this, rather than 60% linole linoleic like normal? Well, that's a thought. So here is, uh, I went through some calculations to estimate how much CLA that, that, uh, uh, that uh, we consume per day. Assume 35% of, of uh, dietary calories are from fat. Assume 50% of daily calories from animals. And 50% for uh, total intake is, 20, is 2,000 calories. And that's fairly typical of many of us. Assume these proportions of dietary animal fat. One, one part beef to one part poultry to one part dairy fat to four tenths part pork and a tenth part fish. And if you do that, your intake is about 120 milligrams. When uh, I just said that you need one to three grams, that's about a tenth of what uh, you might extrapolate from uh, Clement Ip's anti-cancer data. Well, <clears throat> I'm just going to show, this is a fairly complex slide, but I, I want to uh, show you some of the thoughts of why these health benefits seem to be occurring. Uh, scientists are now trying to figure out the mechanism of why CLA has the action that it does. And the actions are listed here at the bottom. Carcinogenesis slowed down atherosclerosis. Cachexia, that's appetite, eating. Inflammatory responses decrease. Muscle catabolism seems slower. Obesity is less. And uh, here's some specific enzymes that seem to process metabolic processes that seem to be impacted. How does this occur by this magic molecule known as CLA? Well, here's a major mechanism that's being studied by many people. It involves this scheme where CLA has a negative effect on the conversion of linoleic acid to arachidonic acid. This is a polyunsaturated fatty acid that is a precursor for prostaglandins. Uh, maybe you've heard of prostaglandins, or they're called isocosinoids, uh, prostaglandin E2, F2 alpha, and so forth. And icosinoids then impact on the influence of TNF alpha. And this is a molecule that helps you destroy your tissue. Uh, so in muscle wasting and all that, TNF alpha is very much involved. TNF alpha seems to be involved in uh, all these processes and icosinoids influence both that TNF alpha. And so the major effect is that CLA is probably having this impact on macrophages and other immune cells producing TNF alpha. Another possibility is that there's a protein called PPAR gamma or PPAR alpha. It's a transcription factor, a protein that binds DNA and controls expression of genes. And uh, CLA is thought to bind to it and influence all these enzymes. And so this is an overall scheme that uh, people are now using to uh, try to understand how CLA has its actions. And nobody really knows for sure. Everything is still postulating. <clears throat> well, 
What I want to do now is uh, tell you a little bit about some uh, Iowa State studies on uh, CLA. So first I'd like to tell you a bit about a study of uh, feeding pigs CLA. Now why would you want to feed pigs CLA? Well, one reason would be to get more CLA in the pork. So that when people consume pork, then it's more healthful. Well, does it do that? Here's uh, a few uh, numbers. Effect of CLA on body composition of finishing pigs. And so the pigs were fed these different amounts of dietary CLA. 1% of the diet was the maximum. And one thing that was observed is, look what's happened to the thickness of the back fat. Centimeters of back fat over the 10th rib. It goes from 2.9 to 2.3 and 2.6. So significant decrease. You see all these have Bs, this has an A, a significant decrease. And every experiment that's been done, CLA decreased the obesity of pigs, and that's good news. Uh, it also increased the size of the loin eye, the, the pork chop. And uh, it changed belly hardness. And let me show you belly hardness uh, in a different way than uh, numbers. And the belly is what produces that uh, bacon that we all like. And so, uh, Here's a, a belly piece from uh, pigs fed no CLA, and that the you see how it hangs over a bar. This is a crude measure, but it seems to illustrate the point. And look what happens to the belly from 0.5 percent uh, CLA added to the diet. That belly you see is stiffer. Well, it turns out that uh, the composition of this fat is significantly changed so that this is more rigid at the same temperature as this one. Um, so, and this is, uh, this is probably good because one of the challenges of meat packers is in being able to slice this well. A real mushy belly doesn't slice well. <clears throat> Another, uh, and a possibility, well, there's pretty good evidence that this is what's happening in that uh, belly to make it harder. Uh, there is a gene for uh, fatty acid desaturase that uh, is ex expressed to form a messenger RNA, and then that messenger RNA is used to make a protein called steroid-CoA desaturase. Now, what does that enzyme do? It catalyzes the conversion of stearic acid, which is a saturated fatty acid, to oleic acid, uh, which is an unsaturated acid. By the way, this is the acid that's rich in olive oil hence the name oleo or oleic acid. And then that gets incorporated into triglyceride. Well, this fatty acid is a liquid at room temperature. This is a solid at room temperature. So you have more of this in the belly. It's going to be more liquid. Well, it turns out that CLA inhibits this gene being expressed into messenger RNA. That has been documented. So there's less of this enzyme to convert stearic acid to oleic acid. So the belly's got more of this than usual. And so the triglycerides don't melt at room temperature and the belly is stiffer. Now, is that a good thing? Probably not. This is a saturated acid. This is unsaturated. Another uh, trait that uh, Fred Parrish and his graduate students uh, demonstrated was that the color of the meat seemed to be affected a bit by uh, CLA. This is one, a pork chop from a pig that's fed no fed the no CLA, and this is one that was fed CLA, redder, pinker, and this is important for our export market. So there might be some advantage uh, for that uh, at feeding CLA to pigs from that point of view. Well, does it improve the CLA content of uh, what you eat? CLA on the subcutaneous adipose tissue and skeletal muscle of pigs fed CLA. So here's some of the different forms of CLA, the different isomers, and again, uh, milligrams per gram of lipid. And so subcutaneous adipose tissue, uh, the dietary CLA is increasing, and so you see the amount of CLA increased as well. So uh, substantial amounts of uh, CLA in the adipose tissue. Well, you don't eat much of the adipose tissue. What about the meat? Skeletal muscle? you see up to about seven uh, milligrams per gram when ordinarily it's very, very low uh, in uh, pork. 
So you can get substantial increases of CLA in pork. Now, what about, um, oh, let's summarize first. So one thing that, occur that occurred in the, uh, all the pig experiments, average daily gain increased, the amount of gain per amount of feed improved, and that's good for efficiency. Uh, decreased back fat thickness, increased loin eye area, increased belly hardness. Those are uh, observations. Uh, there are many others, but those that I chose to mention tonight. Uh, I want to comment a bit about feeding CLA to ruminants. So we've got other challenges now because uh, what happens to uh, CLA as it goes through the rumen where we have that anaerobic fermentation going on. And so a few of us have been involved with with that particular experiment where we used uh, sheep that were uh, surgically fit so that we could make these measurements. We uh, hypothesized that CLA is extensively biohydrogenated in the rumen, that is, the double bonds are reduced to single bonds, and uh, that when you feed the CLA as a calcium salt, it's less extensively biohydrogenated. And so here's an example of CLA as a free acid. Here's CLA as a calcium salt. And so uh, we had a guy in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, prepare this by reacting this with calcium oxide and water. And that makes, of course, calcium hydroxide that's a base and reacts with the acid. And you boil off the water and you end up with a powder. And uh, this should be more insoluble going through the rumen. And we've postulated that bacteria would uh, grab onto this uh, less efficiently. Efficiently. By the way, here's my little pig that uh, CLA, this little pig needs some CLA. See, it's a little bit too fat. So uh, it needed some CLA. Well, what happened to uh, dietary CLA when you feed it sheep? Okay, here's the CLA. We'll ignore all the other acids. Uh, basal diet, there's a 0.29 grams of CLA that gets uh, into the small intestine available for absorption every day. Uh, the diet of uh, CLA fed sheep, we gave it 9.4 grams. So 9.4 grams per day, and look how much he ended up leaving the room and going into the small intestine, 0.62. So 90 plus percent of that ended up being reduced to uh, probably stearic acid. Uh, when you feed it a CLA, salt, a salt of calcium, you see 9 grams put into the diet and 1.28 grams ended up being available for absorption. So we had a doubling of the amount that uh, goes into small intestine and be available for absorption. So our hypothesis was supported by, by two ways. One is extensive degradation and making a calcium salt decreased its degradation. So that's the conclusion that we made from that uh, study. So the, the problem then in feeding ruminants is if you feed 100 grams, uh, you get uh, 10 grams or less being absorbed. And that's pretty expensive. Well, we decided to do an experiment nevertheless with uh, some dairy cows. Um, and again, we wanted to uh, determine if uh, the calcium salt uh, increases CLA content of milk uh, to a greater extent than the free acid. So we're very interested in uh, can you make a, a very rich CLA milk? Well, um, what did we observe? We uh, <coughs> fed dairy cows a basal diet or fed them a soy oil, which is rich in linoleic acid or conjugated linoleic acid or soy plus conjugated linoleic acid as a free acid, or calcium salts, and with soy oil. And uh, let's look at the fat yield. Fat percent in the milk. Ordinary Holstein milk, 3.5%. Feeding soy oil, 2.7. CLA caused the same depression in milk fat percentage. Soy oil plus CLA, a further decrease. Or the calcium salts of uh, CLA decreased by 1%, further decrease when you mix the two. So fat percent uh, decreased uh, by about 35% or so. So we went from 3.5% to 2.5% uh, fat in milk. 
What about CLA content? So we know it's, it's fat depressing. Uh, CLA content in the milk. 0.4 is the uh, common figure, and that's what we observed in our uh, the milk from our cows with uh, no added CLA. And we got it up uh, threefold by feeding soy oil, you see, even more than if you feed just CLA. And certainly, soy oil is going to be cheaper than CLA. So that's an interesting point for any kind of commercial adoption of that technology. Soy plus CLA. 1.3 and calcium salt 0.9 as a salt or 0.7 as an acid so you do get a greater increase with the salt that's for sure uh, and 1.4 which is about four and three and a half times the basal so we could make CLA rich milk that's uh, to be sure so the conclusion from uh, that experiment, feeding soy oil is more effective than feeding CLA to increase the CLA content of milk. And feeding CLA as a calcium salt was uh, more effective. Now I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about a chicken feeding experiment. This is all Iowa State work, so we've uh, got geared up to uh, join the bandwagon, so to speak. Effective dietary CLA on CLA content of eggs. Uh, Jerry Sell is uh, the cooperator in that. So here's what we did. We fed uh, laying hens 0, 1.25, 2.5, and 5% of their diet as CLA. And uh, how did we change CLA content of the eggs? Well, the cis 9 trans 11 went all the way up to 5.3. The trans uh, 10 cis 12 isomer, 3.4, or a total of 8.7 milligrams per gram of fat, or weight percent. So that's fairly substantial amounts of uh, CLA in uh, the uh, eggs. And I can tell you that we took those eggs and uh, boiled, we just did on a side experiment, boiled the eggs, and then you peel the white off the egg, uh, egg yolk that's solidified, and if you drop it, it'll bounce. So clearly you've changed the composition of that egg yolk. And, uh, in fact, you've changed it enough uh, that I think it's become infertile. Why have you changed it? Well, the, uh, I didn't show all the fatty acid composition data, but the delta-9 desaturase, an enzyme that converts stearic acid to oleic acid, we talked about that earlier, that enzyme is in fact inhibited by CLA. So the egg yolk, just like in the bellies of pigs, has more of this and less of this than normal because this enzyme is inhibited. And we, uh, a graduate student, uh, studied this enzyme in the liver of these laying hens. Delta-5 desaturase that makes the arachidonic acid was decreased as well. That's the one that ends up as a precursor to uh, prostaglandins. And another desaturase was inhibited. So fatty acid desaturase in, is inhibited, leading to a more saturated fatty a fat in uh, chicken yolk, chicken egg yolks. And so, because the egg becomes fertile, I think I've got the solution. Uh, <laughs> CLA is the solution to the crow problems at ISU. And if we could just develop a nice feed with some rich enough in CLA, I think 1% one, one of the diet for the crows would make them have trouble having children. And that would be good. <clears throat> in fact, the University of Wisconsin uh, scientists have uh, that idea patented, so that's nothing uh, new. Uh, except they were talking about uh, treating pigeons and cro and uh, and sparrows. Uh, maybe they don't have crow problems in Wisconsin. So the summary is: dietary CLA increased saturated fatty acids, decreased mono and saturated and polyunsaturated eggs and fatty acids in eggs, increased CLA content markedly through a. Uh, and change the uh, fatty acid desaturase. Well, we've done the same kind of work with, uh, with beef cattle to uh, show that uh, feeding CLA to beef cattle changes uh, fatty acid composition, and you can get um, marked increases in uh, CLA content of the fat from beef cattle as well as from uh, the lean. 
So the conclusion of a nice study that uh, Gassman uh, did was feeding CLA to beef cattle increased the CLA content of beef lean and fat. Would you pay more for beef at the store if you knew that it was CLA enriched? Well, if you ate food from all of these that I these uh, products that I mentioned, beef cattle, we've raised uh, the the uh, and if it's beef with 5.5% fat, we've increased the CLA content enough that if you ate a daily intake of beef, 112 grams of beef, uh, you get 12.5 milligrams. It has 12.5 milligrams of CLA per gram, where they give you six, 76 milligrams of CLA. Pork, Fred Parrish's uh, pigs, 4% fat in those loins, has uh, this much CLA per gram of fat, or they'd give you 17. Milk, 3.2% fat, fat, you have this much. Uh, that would give you 316 milligrams of CLA. Or two eggs at 87 milligrams per gram of fat, that would give you 750 milligrams. And so you see, if you ate the two eggs, 700 mils of milk, 62 grams of pork, 112 grams of beef every day, you get 1.159 milligrams of CLA. So it seems practical to me that if one gram per day is reasonable, then potentially we could produce animal-derived foods with that amount of CLA so that you could have natural foods rather than taking a supplement. So it's food for thought. Now another way, uh, I'm going to close on this thought, um, are we making the foods more healthy when we feed CLA to the livestock and make meat, milk, and eggs? Well, one way of making an estimate of that is using what's